Well, hello all. <laughs> I'm Pastor Bob Miller. Let me add my welcome to you all, and it's great to be worshiping with you, however you may be connected with us this morning. Um, feeling the Holy Spirit move on me a little bit here um, to take a little detour. I was, I was watching um, Betsy as she was uh, talking with her, her sons, you know, that, that question. I was reminded of something I learned um, watching a very special mother that I spent some years with, uh, my, my wife. And I learned uh, something that I probably should have recognized by my own mother, but by watching her, I realized that a mom, once you become a mom, you're always a mom, right? 24-7, you're a mom. And I, and I got to thinking about that, and I, you know, I think about getting uh, texts in the middle of the night or, you know, from my daughter and this dad, um, I don't know how to get the car to do this particular thing, you know, and, and I realized, you know, I'm a dad all the time, and, it, and uh, they're, they're not, or she's not eight years old anymore, you know, she's, she's a lot older, and, and then I saw the connection. When... Um, I, I personally believe that being a parent is a gift from God for many reasons. But, but one of those reasons is that it gives us a glimpse of what it's like for God. And if we can, can uh, uh, embrace the fact that once we're a mom or we're a dad, we're always a mom, we're always a dad 24-7, what does that tell you about our dad, our father? always there, 24-7, all the time, will never not be with us. Amen? Amen? Amen. And I know there's some of you saying, well, maybe that's the end of the sermon. Can't be that lucky. I got another one for you. Because today we are finishing uh, our, we're closing, wrapping up our uh, Jesus Apprentice mini-series where we've been, um, just like uh, an, an apprentice of the skills, skilled trades, we've been, we've been studying our, our master craftsman, so to speak, Jesus, and um, we've been doing so that we may learn and embrace and, and more and more become like the master. But perhaps unlike a skilled trades apprentice, as much as we may learn and as much as we may master, there is always, always more we can learn from our master. And so following Christ is a, is a lifelong endeavor. It's a lifelong journey, quite literally a journey for eternity. If we make the choice to, to join Christ on that journey. And, and as pricey as a ticket for such a journey may seem to be at times the cost pales in comparison to the reward that accompanies that journey amen amen yeah all that said but like a skilled trades apprenticeship the more we learn and develop the more challenging the newly acquired skills can become but again they are well worth the effort and the price paid for those skills. Today, for, uh, for our, our wrap-up uh, Sunday, our, our Jesus lesson comes from the Gospel of Luke. And two of the most well-known passages in Scripture, Luke's account of Jesus' great commandment and Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan. So follow along as, as I read aloud. By the way, you'll, you can find this passage in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Let's read. A legal expert stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to gain eternal life? Jesus replied, what is written in the law? How do you interpret it? The legal expert responded. He said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said to him, 
you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But the legal expert wanted to prove that he was right. So he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man went down from Jerusalem, from Jerusalem to Jericho. He encountered thieves who stripped him naked, beat him up, and left him near death. Now it just so happened that a priest was also going down the same road. When he saw the injured man, he crossed over to the other side of the road and went on his way. Likewise, a Levite came by that spot, saw the injured man, and crossed over to the other side of the road and went on his way. A Samaritan, who was on a journey, came to where the man was. But when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. The Samaritan went to him and bandaged his wounds, tending them with oil and wine. Then he placed the wounded man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took two full wages, or full, let me do that again. The next day, he took two full days worth of wages and gave them to the innkeeper. He said, take care of him, and when I return, I will pay you back for any additional costs. What do you think? Which one of these three was a neighbor to the man who encountered thieves? Then the legal expert said, the one who demonstrated mercy toward him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. My good friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, the, the legal expert or scribe, it, it might be, uh, he might be called a scribe in your particular translation, same thing, asked Jesus how he can obtain eternal life. Jesus asked him, well, what does Scripture say about that? And the legal expert or the scribe responds with what many of us do find familiar and recognize as the great commandment. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus affirms that, that he's on the right track. And, and he says, you have answered correctly. Do this, we're a little quick on that, there you go, and you will live. So, the thing is, is, is being familiar can sometimes lead us into a bit of complacency. I mean, have you ever really stopped to think about what Jesus was really saying in, in, in this passage? Because that great commandment is not a trivial thing to do. Love God basically with everything we have and are. That means love God absolutely first and foremost. And there's a lot of things we love and love a lot in this world. And here Jesus is saying that God needs to, to hold the number one absolute top spot above everything, above everyone else. That's big. And it, and it directly challenges a great deal, if not all, of what the world relentlessly tries to convince us as truth. But then we have to remember that, that God is counterintuitive to the way that our distorted world works. And that loving God first and foremost does not reduce or negate the love we have for others. Rather, it actually enriches our life. It, it, it provides a foundation, the foundation, that improves our relationships with others. Loving God first gives us the ability to love others even more. Admittedly challenging, but we can buy that, right? You can buy that? Yeah? But then there's that love your neighbor as yourself part, which, which just conjures up all kinds of questions. 
<laughs> Interestingly, of all the follow-up questions that that legal ex expert could have asked, he, he doesn't ask, so how can I do that? Or what does that look like? Or, or, or even, well, if I'm honest, I'm not sure I can do that. What if I need help? Rather, he says, okay, and who is my neighbor? He's essentially questioning the, the, the meaning of neighbor. The legal expert wants to know just how far his love for others really needs to go. Where exactly does his responsibilities end? What are the limits? I can almost hear the, the legal expert thinking to himself, yeah, there are neighbors, my folk, and then there are all the rest, the, the them. Thing is, even though we live 2,000 years and thousands of miles away from when and where Jesus was having this conversation, we have plenty of our own them labels that can cause us to squirm over this neighbor thing, right? And, and many of those labels are still the same as they were back then. Um, race, class, gender, political party. Well, well, maybe political party is more unique to us, but still, what that's all talking about is the relevance of the category of non-neighbor. Anyway, Jesus answers the legal expert's question about who is his neighbor by telling him the parable of the Good Samaritan, which is also familiar, right? And it's well recognized by Christians and, and non-Christians alike. But its meaning is much better understood when we understand that Samaritans were considered virtual enemies of the Jews. They didn't hang out together. They, they definitely didn't live together. They didn't even want to be in the same, well, caught dead in the same presence of one another. The, the Samaritans lived in Samaria, and the Jews lived in Judea. That, by the way, is how we know that the, the man um, that was robbed and beaten and left for dead was a Jew because he came from Jerusalem on his way to Jericho. And that's important because after being passed by, first by the, the Jewish priest who performs sacrifices and provides instruction and, and maintains the Jewish temple, and then by the Levite, who is a member of the elite class that, that assists worship in the Jewish temple, it was only a Samaritan, a sworn enemy of the Jews, who, upon seeing the, the, the victimized man, was moved with compassion. And then who, who stopped, who tended the man's wounds, who, who took him to an inn and continued to take care of him, basically putting that man's needs above his own. And even more, when the Samaritan had to leave, the Samaritan gave two days' wages to the innkeeper for the man's care, which, by the way, would have covered weeks of cost, only to then vow to reimburse the innkeeper for any additional costs that may have been incurred above that two days' wages. Now, we need to be careful to, to not turn the priest and the Levite into the villains of the story. The, the text doesn't say why the two didn't choose to stop. And there's plenty of technical and cultural reasons why they may have rationalized just continuing on. But still, Jesus doesn't condone them not stopping either. As is so often the case, the the bother and discomfort of, of helping have kept that man dying on the road. And admittedly, if we, we think about it from our perspective, sometimes getting involved is costly. And for many, the investment's too high. Still, it is cause to pause and consider what Jesus would really 
rather have us do. But Jesus' real point is not who doesn't help, but who does. And no doubt those hearing Jesus tell this parable would have been really surprised, if not shocked, at who does help. Jesus articulates in substantial detail what the, what the Samaritan does, what action he takes, what sacrifices he makes. And then, as the parable says, Jesus finishes by asking the legal expert to tell him of the three who came across the person who was victimized, which one acted more like a neighbor. And even though that legal expert could not bring himself to actually saying, saying the term Samaritan, there was no refuting who the only one was that demonstrated mercy to a person in need. It was the Samaritan who loved that person in need as he loved himself. Can you see how through this interchange, Jesus redefines neighbor much more broadly and inclusively. Jesus just literally proclaimed that good Samaritan, that enemy of the Jews, as a neighbor. And then, by inference, through the, the great commandment, considered the one in desperate need also as neighbor. So, as well as speaking to, to who is to be considered a neighbor, anyone in need, through this parable, Jesus clearly articulates how to be a neighbor. That is, through mercy and compassion. None of the other myriad of attributes that we so often use to judge others are relevant in assigning the term of neighbor as far as Jesus is concerned. But then, Jesus places an exclamation point on the whole conversation and proclaims God's associated intention for God's followers when he says, go and do likewise. In other words, go and be a neighbor. Who, how, and be. But how do, do we go about doing that? Actually, that's starting to sound a lot like those questions we mentioned earlier that the legal expert did not ask Jesus. How do I love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my being, with all my strength, with all my mind, and love my neighbors as myself? What does that look like? Or even, to be honest, Jesus, I'm not sure I really can do that because I know I got some baggage I'm dealing with. Jesus, I'm going to need your help. And I think that beginning to answer questions such as those begins with our really wanting to be apprentices of Jesus. Really wanting, really wanting to learn, to embrace, to develop into more and more the master, the, the image of Christ with each passing day. And then it's consciously, expressly asking God to open our eyes, our ears, our hearts to the priorities and awareness that are aligned with God's will. Which may very well position ourselves to be surprised by the, the whom and the how God may be calling us to be neighbors. 
informing us as to, to where and how we may make some kind of difference, a difference to someone who may be suffering, a difference to a way of doing things that's holding a people back, a difference to a group that desperately longs to be welcomed and accepted and embraced, informing us as to who in need we may prioritize over ourselves, who in need we might be the ones that can offer the help that is most needed. Being a neighbor, demonstrating our love for another, for someone in need, as we love ourselves. My dear friends, may we be that neighbor that shows mercy, even when others may look away and cross to the other side to avoid the situation. May we show the compassion of Christ, particularly in those places where the world would rather Christ not be found. And may we be the living and proactive presence of Christ in all we say and do. May it be so. Amen? Amen. Amen.